Hi and welcome to my channel where I talk about true crime and sketchy stories while also doing composite sketches, portraits in memory of victims or of missing people. Today we are doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be creating an age progressed composite sketch by using previously done composite sketches of the same suspect. And we're going to be talking about a serial killer who was never caught, but who left a trail of devastation in the Midwest in the early 90s. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you like this video. Let's get into the sketches first. These are the various composite sketches of the suspect. There are some major differences here, but there are also many similarities that I'm going to focus on more heavily since these seem to be the distinguishing features. So for example, the prominent heavy eyelids, the skinny face, and also the thin lips. For other details of the sketch, I'm going to be focusing on this particular sketch because it was developed using the description provided by the witness who interacted with the suspect for the longest time period and would therefore presumably be able to provide the most detail. If the suspect is still alive today, he would probably be in his 60s. So using all of this information, I'm going to draw what I think he might look like today. Now let's talk about the case itself. 26-year-old Robin Fuldauer was one of two part-time employees at the Payless Shoe Source store. Off Payless Shoe Source store, say that three times fast, off of Interstate 70 in eastern Indianapolis. On the 8th of April, 1992, Robin's co-worker called in sick so she was manning the store by herself. Later that afternoon, customers were coming into the store, but they were finding it empty. They couldn't find anyone on duty, so some of them actually ended up stealing some shoes and making a quick getaway. There were no cameras in the store. Sometime later that day, Robin's lifeless body was discovered in the storage room. She had been shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber semi-automatic handgun. A few dollars had been stolen from the cash register. Robin was described as an intelligent and kind soul. Nobody knew why someone would have targeted her. The manager of a paint store described seeing a man in a green jacket carrying a bag and sitting on the pavement watching the Payless store for some time before the murder. He was apparently talking and giggling to himself and rifling through his bag. The witness later saw the man in the green jacket hitchhiking before the body was discovered. The witness said it looked like the suspect had been sleeping in his clothes. Then, three days later, the bodies of 23-year-old Patricia Smith and 32-year-old Patricia Magers were found inside a bridal shop in Wichita, Kansas, a few miles off the Interstate 70. The crime scene was nearly identical. Both women had been shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber handgun and a few dollars had been stolen from the cash register. Another eerie similarity? All three women were petite and had shoulder-length brown hair. The younger of the two women, Patricia Smith, had gotten married only nine months before. She was studying nursing at Wichita State University and dreamed of one day working in pediatrics. The other Patricia, Patricia Magers, was very happily married to her husband, Mark, and her and her husband owned the shop. The police ended up linking the killings and then the media dubbed the murderer the I-70 killer because of the proximity to the Interstate 70. His killing spree stretched across multiple cities in the Midwest. He is not to be confused with the I-70 Strangler, who is another killer. Let me know if you want me to talk about him in a future video. In Robin's case, there were no witnesses, but police got luckier with a second incident. The two women were keeping the store open later than usual because a customer was picking up a cummerbund at 6 p.m. The customer arrived and he was confronted by a man who he described as thin, probably in his late 30s, about 5 foot 7, between 140 to 160 pounds, with reddish hair, lazy eyelids, a high forehead, and thin lips. He was clean cut and neatly dressed. He appeared to be in an almost trance-like state and he was holding a gun. He ordered the customer to go into the back room, but the customer refused and ended up fleeing the scene. His description of the killer produced the sketch that I am referencing most in my composite, because it seems like he got the best look at the guy. 
40-year-old Michael McCown was a happy and musical guy who played bass guitar and wore his hair in a long brown ponytail. He also helped his mother out in the ceramics store she owned, just off the I-70. He was busy stocking shelves on April the 27th when he was shot from behind. Authorities believe he was mistaken for a woman due to his hair. His wallet was stolen, but he still had $15 in his pocket. On the 3rd of May, the killer claimed another victim. 24-year-old Nancy Kitzmiller, a line dancing fanatic who had graduated with a degree in geography, was shot and killed in a boot city in St. Charles, Missouri, just off the I-70. She was due to start another job in just a few weeks. She was killed just after 2.30 p.m. in broad daylight, but there were no witnesses. Nancy's parents have said that they will never get over her death. Just four days after Nancy's murder, the killer struck again in Raytown, Missouri. 37-year-old reflexologist Sarah Blessing was shot and killed in a health store at around 6.15 p.m. A video store owner across the health store heard the pop from the gun and he rushed to see what was going on and he ended up discovering Sarah's body. Other witnesses reported seeing a man in a grey suit jacket enter the store shortly before the shots were heard. Yet another witness also reported seeing the same man walking up a hill towards the I-70 after the murder. Sarah loved gardening and health foods and she was happily married and she had a dog and a cat that she adored. All of the victims except the Patricias were alone at the time of the murders. It always took place during quiet times of the day and all stores were located in strip malls off the I-70. In 1993 and 1994, there was a spate of similar killings in Texas. Mary Ann Glasscock, a 51-year-old clerk at Emporium Antiques in Fort Worth, Texas, was shot in the head and killed on September 25, 1993. About a month later, 22-year-old Amy Vess was murdered inside a dance clothing store in Arlington. Then, 35-year-old Vicki Webb was shot at a Houston gift shop, but she managed to survive. Unfortunately, she was left paraplegic. The suspect's gun misfired as he tried to shoot her a second time, and he ended up leaving her for dead, which possibly saved her life. The Texas shootings have never been officially linked to the original spree. However, it is suspected by some that the same man may be responsible. However, some are not convinced because a different gun was used in the Texas murders. This is not an immediate disqualifier though, because the bullet casings the I-70 killer left behind contain traces of jeweler's rouge, which shows that he was knowledgeable about weapons and may have had more than one firearm. The rouge would be used to polish the feed ramp of the firearm to ensure that the bullet doesn't hang up or in other words get stuck, and this would have ensured more successful murders. This rouge is available at many hardware stores, so it would not be a viable lead to try and track down all the people who purchased it at that time. Something which strikes me as odd is the different descriptions of the man. On one day, he looks disheveled and like he was sleeping in his clothes, and the next he seems clean-cut and well-dressed. It might not be a big deal, but it does seem a little bit strange to me. The I-70 killer was never identified and never caught. Okay, now let's talk about some of the suspects. First, there was Donald Waterhouse. On February the 29th, 1992, so about a month before the murder started, Donald killed both his mother and his stepfather by shooting them with a 22 caliber handgun. He also fit the physical description of the I-70 killer. He was then on the run during the time of the I-70 murders, and his truck was found abandoned right off the I-70 in East St. Louis. Eventually, he was captured in October. The FBI had gotten involved in investigating him, but even before he was captured, they had announced that he was no longer a top suspect in the case. Another suspect is Herb Baumeister, the I-70 strangler I mentioned before. However, he has a very different victim profile and MO. Yet another suspect is suspected serial killer Neil Falls, who moved to Kansas just before the murders started. He was later murdered, well, killed, in self-defense by a woman he had tried to strangle. There is no evidence linking him to the I-70 murders, and shooting a victim and strangling a victim seems very different to me. 
One is quite distant, the other one is very personal. Neil is possibly also linked to the murder and dismemberment of multiple women, as well as the disappearance of many others. And if he was dismembering women, this does seem to be very, very different to the mindset of the I-70 killer. But we don't know, and at the end of the day, the killer has still not been caught, well, not that we know of, anyway. And that is the story of the I-70 serial killer. It would be amazing if this case could be solved one day to bring some closure to the families. Let me know who you want me to talk about in future videos. Thank you for watching.